So, Acts chapter 27 is Paul's journey to Rome. Now, it is a, it's a very strange journey. And we come across a certain kind of wind in Acts 27 called the Eurocladon. The Eurocladon. And the Eurocladon is a northeaster that you just can't survive, basically. And the timing of this wind is essential to understanding this chapter. So very often Jesus taught some, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's what parable means. An earthly story, maybe about seed or plants or farmers or fishing, with a heavenly meaning. Now, from a Jewish perspective, this happens much more than we kind of understand as Gentiles. There's a word called midrash, which means to search deeper, to look deeper. And you find that there's many accounts in the Bible, Joseph would be a great example, that you look at it on one level, it's talking about the life of Joseph, but on a completely different level, it's talking about the Lord himself. It has a heavenly meaning. And as we look at this passage here, there is no doubt on one level, Praise God, it's talking about Paul's journey. But on another level, it's talking about how we get through really difficult storms in our lives. And on another level, it's talking about a remnant in the last days, in the very, very last days. It's talking about all these things simultaneously. Now, boats in scripture are always eschatological. Very often they are. That they, they are talking about the last things. So if you remember, God commanded Noah in Genesis chapter 6 to build a boat. And that boat was built not for sailing on. It wasn't a pleasure cruiser, was it? It was built to withstand the, 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 the terrible storms and floods that were coming. That's why it was built. And it wasn't necessarily the boat that saved them. It was the fact that God was in that boat, you know, and Noah, I'm sure you know this, but Noah, his name means rest. And Jesus said to me, come to me. He said, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. And all the animals poured towards the ark. We read in the book of Acts, Peter saw all these different kinds of animals and the Lord showed Peter that the animals represent the Gentile nations. That's so important to understand. So when you see the animals pouring into the ark in Genesis chapter 6, it's a picture of all the Gentile nations pouring in to the ark to be saved from the wrath which is to come. Now again, we see this this same pattern in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we see Jesus send the disciples out on a boat. And on the boat they come across the Eurocladon. They come across this northeaster, which without the help of God, it would have killed them. Now, for those of you that uh, don't know, there's certain times of the year when the wind really gets up. And in Israel, it's around Octoberish time. And that was the time that they were to set sail. We went to Glebe Farm. In, in fact, it was uh, Halloween, it was the first day there. And uh, we, we, set up the, we set up the camper van. And the winds were absolutely unbelievable. They were southeasters. But they were coming across these flat fields. And I can remember opening the door and we were setting it all up and the door just slammed on my fingers like the wind just caught it and then the same day it cracked you round the back of the head didn't it really are you thinking is this, is this the taste of things to come here what what are we doing here and it just savagely it was beating broadside the side of the van for for three four five weeks just savage well at least we know this thing's waterproof but th this is what happens as a certain time of the year when the Eurocladon comes. Now, you do understand that the word wind in the Greek and in the Hebrew, by the way, means spirit. Yeah. Spirit. So when you're talking about winds, you're talking about 
the Spirit. Now also this time of year that Paul would sail, which was a crazy time of year to sail. The only reason why they were sailing at this time of year was because of the profit margin in it. Because they got prisoners, every prisoner was worth money. There was grain that had come from Egypt, from Alexandria that was going to Rome because they relied on the wheat from Egypt. There was a lot of money and it had got to get there, despite whatever happened with the weather. But it was the Feast of Trumpets. It was Rosh Hashanah. It was leading up to Yom Kippur. And so they would be on this boat in the pitch black in a horrendous, indescribable storm during the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. Are you getting the picture? And during this time, they would celebrate Yom Kippur. The timing is so important. Now, the... the, um, the uh, Let's have a quick look, actually, just before we go any further. Have a quick look at John chapter 6 this morning. John chapter 6. The storm that the disciples went through is mentioned four times. Now, I hope you get... This shows you how important it is. If things are mentioned twice in Scripture, they're important. If they're mentioned in all four Gospels, they are of massive importance. So in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we have this storm. So John 6:16, 6, it says, Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into the boat, they went over the sea toward Capernaum. It was already dark. All these things mean something. And Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. This is the Eurocladon. This is the same wind that uh, Paul would face. So they had rowed about three to four miles. Now this point that they were crossing, again, this is massively significant, is about seven miles. They'd reached around about the mid part of this seven mile journey. They saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to them, and they were afraid. And he said to them, it is I, this is all important, be, uh, be not afraid or be of good cheer. They willingly received him in the boat. And immediately, the boat was on the other side. Immediately. As soon as Jesus got in that boat, bang, they got to the shore. Now, when you read all four accounts, it builds up a picture. So you've got Noah, who's commanded to build not a luxury liner, but something that will simply withstand massive, massive judgment, floods. And you've got the disciples, the elect, that Jesus commanded them to go across to the other side. But halfway across, in the pitch black, says on one of the Gospels, Jesus was on a mountain and he perceived that they were struggling. Well, you can't see anything. You ask Viv, if you're up on a mountain on one of the hills looking over Galilee in the pitch black dark, you wouldn't see a boat. No, he perceived that the disciples were in trouble. There's much more going on here than meets the eye. This leads us to this amazing account. And we have to thank God for... You know, years ago I went to a, 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 a Jewish roots uh, Bible school. I didn't enrol or anything, I just went there because I just wanted more. I was hungry. Church wasn't enough, I, I wanted more. So every Wednesday we used to go down and to this Jewish roots Bible uh, uh, college and just take in and write and learn as much as we can. And we learned about Midrash. We learned about pattern prophecy. We learned that the things which have happened in the past are going to be replayed. And every time they're replayed, they move towards a, a finale. And listen, friends, we're Gentiles. And the, the Lord loves us all. He loves the Gentiles. But you've got to understand this. The Gentiles have been grafted into the olive tree. Yeah. 
They've been grafted into the olive tree. We've been grafted into the plans of Israel. And so all those glorious truths in the word of God belong to the Gentiles as much as they do the Jews. And um, so what we're looking at, the way that we're going to look at this this morning is kind of very Jewish in a way. But um, I'm sure, you, you know, it'll make some kind of sense. So Paul appears, appeals to Caesar, Nero, the first Caesar where his numerics literally added up to 666. Again, this is no coincidence. There is a reason for this. So he was appealing to Nero and eventually he got to sail. Now, you, you get on a, a, a pleasure cruise today or, you know, a plane to go anywhere. You get on the plane, you go to the, normally to the destination. You might have a couple of stops on a long, but you go to the, but this was not that, right? This was, these were ships that were trade ships that actually went in the opposite direction to Rome first, curved around the coast, right the way around to right up by Turkey. So a good half of this journey was Paul going in the opposite direction of Rome. But that's the way it was. And it wasn't until they got around that region that they swapped to a much bigger ship that would take them to Rome. So as a prisoner in those days... You know, or even somebody that didn't have that kind of money, you would have to go along on the ride. Wherever the, the ship went, you'd have to go along. Eventually you'd get there, but it'd just take a long time. So that's why we get all these crazy stops. Um, Acts chapter 27. And it was decided that we should sail to Italy. And they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan Regiment. Always Luke paints the centurions in a good light. Always. If you notice, he always does that. Because he wants us to know that Christianity then was not seen as a problem to the Roman Empire. That's really important. At the beginning, it was not a problem. The problem, as we've seen all the way through the book of Acts, was from the Jews. They just couldn't accept that Jesus Christ was their Messiah. That's where the problem was. It begins that way, but of course, we know that after the book of Acts, well, then persecution starts to come from the, the government itself. But this man, Julius, is another one that favours Paul. Daniel had favour, didn't he? Joseph had favour. In this world, if we're, if we're living for the Lord, we should have some favour, even with unbelievers. And they should look at us and, you know, respect us. So, entering a ship at a dramatium, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. So this is around about Turkey. Right, completely the opposite direction. This is almost like Paul going on a fourth missionary journey here. Aristarchus, a Macedonian, this is one of, his, one of his disciples from Thessalonica, was with us. So we know that Luke was there. We know that Aristarchus was there. How amazing, by the way, because Paul calls him my fellow prisoner. And he voluntarily went to prison just to be with Paul in Rome. Ha! Wow. Wow. And the next day we landed at Sidon. And this is where it starts. And Julius treated Paul kindly, gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care, because he'd planted churches all around that area. But notice this, notice this, favour, favour. And we should still be having some favour today. But according to this, not man, according to this, that favour is going to start to diminish. And it's going to turn to, well, I'll use the words of Jesus, it's going to turn to hatred. You shall be hated by all nations for my name's sake. At the moment there's favour, but it starts to turn. And when he had put to sea from there, we sailed under the, sh the shelter of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. 
Now, bearing in mind what the word win means, pneuma, it's where we get pneumatics from, this means the spirit. On the heavenly meaning of this is, the winds are changing. The spirit is against us. Daniel chapter 7, you see that the, the, the beasts are stirring up the winds on the Mediterranean Sea. Change, change is coming and not for the good. So the winds here begin to get contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, to the city of Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. Now this ship was mainly a ship that contained wheat from Egypt. You know, remember Joseph? And this wheat would go to Italy. So it had really two things on board. It had prisoners, which were probably going to be, they were very valuable because of the games. They were all worth something. And so they would be, they needed to keep them alive uh, because of course the games and whatever Nero had planned for these people. And then there was wheat. Well, there was some wheat on that ship in the Apostle Paul. Boy, was there some wheat on that ship with the Apostle Paul. If, you know, you want, you want to see the finest of the wheat, just read Paul's letters. And I'm, I'm hoping and praying that, well, that there is lasting fruit from looking at this. And that one of the things that it will do is to inspire you to look at the letters again in the light of the book of Acts. And you'll understand it much more. So, verse 7. When they had sailed slowly many days. So the same trip had taken them something like two days earlier on. Now it's many days. They arrived with difficulty of Nidus. So can you see what's happening slowly? It begins with favour. Then the winds are contrary. Then it gets very difficult. The wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter uh, of Crete of Salmon. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. And this is how it is. This is how it is going to be. Jesus described the last days that they would be like labour pains. And labour pains can come on very strong. Not that I have much experience of them, but I've still got the nail marks in my hands. They can come on very strong, but then there's respite. There's respite. And then it starts again. And then there's respite. There's another fair haven. There's another time of rest. But... Incrementally, they get closer and closer together until you get to the big one. And that's when Mandy literally screamed the ward down. And the, the, the nurse said to me, press that button over there. I said, what, the one with the emergency written on? She said, yes, that one. <laughs> so there's always respite between these things. There always is. And you can think... Well, that means we're going to be all right. Now, COVID-19, according to Matthew chapter 24, is a birth pang. It's pastel, it's a birth pang. You look at India right now. Uh, I tell you what, India right now, they don't have much faith in their caste system. You look at the caste system in India, the richest of the rich are fighting over plane tickets. The middle class, they're fighting over oxygen. And the poorest of the poor are fighting over wood for the funeral pyres. The caste system doesn't work. And it's, these things are revealing the religions, if you like, that are, are not of God. And, and there are people in India that are getting saved off the back of this. 
It is their own Eurocladon. It's sweeping through India right now. And God will always bring good. Always bring good. So there was a respite. Verse 9. Now when much time had been spent, uh, and the sailing was now dangerous, because the fast had, was already over, Paul advised them. What was the fast? The fast was Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Now this is, we'll, we'll come to this at the end, but this is very important. The number 14 in scripture is incredibly relevant. Have you seen the genealogy in Matthew that it's split up into three sets of 14? There's a reason for that. Each one is a new season. 14 generations, one season done. 14 generations, another season done. 14 generations, another season done. On the 14th of Nisan, God told the Jews that what you think is the end of the year is now going to be the beginning. It's going to be a new beginning. So what was considered to be the seventh month before Moses became the first month. The 14th of Nisan. The number 14, is, it's a number of new beginnings. The number 15, well we'll look at that later on. Because that follows 14. <laughs> now what, what you've got on the Jewish calendar here, it begins with Nisan. The 14th of Nisan, Passover, Jesus fulfilled that. But ultimately, the, the most joyous feast of all is the 15th of Tishri. So at each end, you have a feast. 14th of Nisan, the beginning. 15th of Tishri, the end. Marking utter joy and celebration and liberty and peace and love, eternal life. The millennial reign. Yeah. But the number 14 is going to come up again and again in here. Because it's a significant number. It really is. As we'll look at in a bit. After the fast, so this is Yom Kippur. And at Yom Kippur, every single Jew had to make up their mind. Either they were utterly wicked or utterly righteous. And the ten days of awe, which led up to Yom Kippur, were ten days of retrospection to examine yourself and to make up your mind what you are. Am I utterly wicked or am I utterly righteous? Because there's no in between. And by the way, the book of Revelation makes that absolutely clear. The book of Revelation says, let the wicked carry on being wicked, let the righteous carry on being righteous. And yet all of us in this room know some really nice people that are not saved, but they're nice people, genuine people. But according to the word of God, there is coming a total polarisation of mankind. And Yom Kippur, this last feast, Yom Kippur was all about preparing the Jewish people to meet with their God. Once every 50 years on Yom Kippur, once every 50 years on Yom Kippur, the last trump of the, of the year would be blown. And the captives would go free. And debt was cancelled once every 50 years on Yom Kippur. The last trump would be blown. The last trump is not in the Feast of Trumpets, friends. It happens once every 50 years on Yom Kippur. Some of you are thinking, what on earth is he going on about? <laughs> What's this got to do with sailing across the sea? Where are you going with this? <laughs> so the fast, the fast was the last feast. Yes. And what a feast it's going to be. Okay, verse 10. Paul then says, Man, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster. Now the word perceive there means, I perceive through experience. I perceive through experience 
Why? He tells you in 2 Corinthians, he'd already been shipwrecked three times. This man knew about sailing. He knew about winds. He knew about air pressure changing. He knew when the clouds, you know, well, even Jesus told us, you know, you look at red sky at night and all that stuff. I perceive by experience that this is going to end in disaster. And, and I'm sure they're thinking, well, what are you? You're a rabbi. You're not a sailor. But he says, I perceive it will end in disaster with much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the captain, the helmsman, and the owner of the ship than the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbour was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix. So there they were. In fair havens, they were in the right place. They were at the place to stay for winter. Just stay, stop, don't go any further. But they decide, no, we, this ship's got to go on. Why? Because of the financial implications. We've got to get these prisoners to Rome. We've got to get this wheat to Rome. We can't wait for winter. There's 276 men on board here. There's a lot of money at stake. So we're going to sail from Fair Havens. We're going to go around the coast and we're going to stop at a much better place called Phoenicia. We're going to stop there because there was restaurants, there was bars, there was nice food. That's where all the sailors stayed. There was good accommodation there. That's where you stayed. You didn't stay at Fair Havens. You stayed there. And Paul's saying, don't make the journey. Don't do it. And they're saying, Paul, the majority rules. You're outvoted, mate. And that's what we're going to see more and more. And, uh, you know, democracy is, is the best of many evils, isn't it, as term as politics go. But what you're going to see more of is an elite form of democracy an elite form of democracy, it will slowly fade to grey and it will disappear to black eventually. It's going to turn very, very sour. But the, the vote that the born-again Christian will put on their paper will be outnumbered in the days to come, according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. So he was outvoted by the majority so, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbour of Crete, opening toward the southeast and northwest, and winter there. So they made this vote. In verse 13 it says, And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. And you can imagine it, can't you? Told you. What do you know about sailing? We're the ones that know about sailing, Paul. Who do you think you are? Perfect wind, off we go, we'll, 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 we'll stay there and, and that'll do. And this is how it goes. And it happens so many times. There's this terrible wind. There's, you know, the world comes under terrible judgment. Look at the Second World War. Unreal. Who would ever have thought that there'd be such respite and you get respite. Look at the Twin Towers. I thought that was the beginning of World War III at the time. I was convinced, this is it. We've How can that even happen? Then you get respite. And Paul says, I'm telling you this is going to end in disaster. Nice soft wind blowing and they're saying, no, nah, no. Nah. You've completely got this wrong, old man. This book that you follow, it's antiquated. It's not relevant anymore. You need to get with it. We're postmodern now. Verse 14. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called the Eurocladon. Eurocladon. The word tempestuous there means typhoon. Not long after, a tempestuous storm rose up. Now, it's almost impossible to even think what this must have been like. Because, well, as you'll see, they're out of 
total control. Now here's the thing. Storms are designed to show us what's in us. And what you see in this chapter is a man that's kind of in the background at the beginning, the Apostle Paul, you know, the, 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 the captain, the, the owner of the ship, they're making the decisions. By the end of this chapter, they haven't got a clue. Not a clue. And Paul is calling all the shots. Storms are there to reveal what's in us. Doesn't it say that in Daniel? About those that will, it says they'll fall, they'll be refined. Why? To show us what's in us. And so whenever we go through a storm of any kind, the Lord will show you what's in you. And so very often I find with, with Christians, committed Christians, that they realise that what's been invested in them is more precious than they'll ever understand. Yeah. That with the majority of Christians, spirit-filled believers, they can get through some seriously bad times. And they realise just how precious Christ is in their life. So this is the Eurocladon. This is it. This is the same wind that hit the disciples on the Sea of Galilee. So when the ship was caught and, and, and could not, they could not head into the wind, we let her drive. We let her drive. We're all control freaks, friends. All of us. We are. Every, every person on some level is a control freak. We did this detox with, uh, with uh, Mikey and Natasha. But they eat at completely different times to us. And we're there, you know, come on. She's not the time that we eat, you know. It's like half past nine at night. They're eating and thinking, come on. We have got used to the time that we eat. And we, we just don't realise where our life is just so arranged. And whenever that's kind of in any way messed up, it's very, very difficult. Well, in a Eurocladon, in a storm in your life, what happens is God begins to drive you. He allows Satan, he allows the enemy to drive you, but God is behind it. He's in control. He's always in control. And you start going off on a direction that you never intended to go in. Listen, this boat with 276 people in went 500 miles off from where they were supposed to be heading. 500 miles being driven by this insane wind. Out of all control. Oh, don't you hate being out of control? They were driven. And running under the shout of the islands called Claudia, we secured a skiff with difficulty. That's a, a kind of a lifeboat. With difficulty. And when they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, fearing lest they should run aground. On the Surtees sands that they, uh, they uh, struck sail. So they were driven. So this is what's happening. You've got to get this, folks. This is not a normal wind. Don't think about normal winds. This thing was savage. It was every hour was incredibly hard work. And during this time, they're trying to undergird the boat. They, can you imagine trying to do that in that kind of weather? How on earth do you even do that? Dropping down ropes or chains and somehow bringing them under the hull and bringing them around the other side and tightening them up as much as they can because they knew, they knew that the ship was going to be pulled apart. This is important. All they were doing is slowing down the process. Now when you understand the last days, and you read what the scriptures say concerning the last days, the only thing you can do is slow down the process. 
Because there are things which, it says in Revelation, must take place. And so we do our best. And the church, generally speaking, at this moment, they have these huge chains on board. There's going to come a point where this Eurocladon hits the church. And when it does, we'll try everything we can to keep it together. But all you're doing is delaying the inevitable. That's all you're doing. The ship will be torn to pieces. And at that time, you will begin to realise what Christianity is really all about. I talked to Joan, not this, not this last week, the week before, and she said... She's never felt Jesus speak to her more clearly through the scriptures than at this time in her life. That's what happens. Because all the distractions are taken out of the way. It's you and it's the Lord. That's what it becomes about. And God uses these things. As hard as they are, he uses them. So they were driven. I was told, oh, it's a few years ago now, about a church in Congleton, United Reformed Church in Congleton, that we're going to, uh, the really advocates for homosexuality and transgender stuff uh, in Congleton. And uh, Wow, there's just been an article, is it in the paper? What was it in? Yeah, an article on the Congleton Hub now, um, really praising the churches that have gotten involved with the transgender thing, really praising them. Um, but there's a testimony of uh, somebody that went along that was not accepted by one or two of the churches, and of course that was seen as a very, very shameful thing. So a few years ago, it was the United Reformed Church. Now... It sounds to me like it's the majority of the churches in Congleton that are rapidly changing their views. And you need to understand this. The church is being driven. It's being driven. It's just being driven off on this tangent. And it will get stronger and stronger and stronger. And I've, I, keep, I say this, folks, not, not, to, not to shock... Not to shock, but people need to understand it doesn't stop here. This is not where it stops. You think this is it? Oh, it won't get any worse. No. Morally, it's that we're going to reach an absolute breakdown. A total breakdown. So they were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest and tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. Imagine this. Folks, Money is most people's God. People that are not saved, money is their God. Money is everything. They work their life to get certain possessions and things together. It's everything to them. You know, they go, the social circles, everything they talk about, they, part of the thing about having good things is to rub it into somebody else. You know, that's part of the pleasure. Ha ha, look what we've got. And it's, of course, we don't say it like that because we're far too subtle to do that, but that's what we do. And, 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 And possessions and money and these things are so important. But in a situation like this where you realize this is it, this is it, we are not going to last this thing out, they literally start to throw overboard all of their profit. Everything that this journey was about, they're now throwing overboard. They're throwing it overboard into the sea. Verse 20. Now when neither... The sun nor the stars appeared for many days. 
and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. This is deeply eschatological. If you look at scripture, if you look at Matthew chapter 24, whenever you see the sun and the moon not giving their light, the next thing you see is this. That's terrible. <laughs> Dear me, sorry Lord. <laughs> sorry about that. It's just terrible. But that's the next thing that you see. When the sun and the moon and the stars, they don't give the light, watch out. Because the next thing that you see, and around about that time, all hope is gone. All hope is gone. No hope anymore. Literally, no hope. You look at Revelation chapter 6, you can see it for yourself. Go and have a look in your own time. You will see martyrs underneath the altar. They're clothed with white robes. They're waiting. They're waiting. They're souls and they're waiting. And you see the sun and the moon and the stars no longer giving the light. And it says, who can save us from the wrath of the Lamb? And in the very next chapter... A multitude from every tribe, tongue and nation have appeared after the sun, the moon and the stars. There's going to come a point, friends, and you can read the testimonies of Corrie Ten Boom. You can read about people like Richard Wormbrand who was tortured for 17 years in a Russian prison, Romanian prison. You can read about these people and there are times when there seems to be absolutely no hope at all. And they had given up. They'd given up. But midnight is where the day begins. Midnight is where the day begins. And the God that we serve is not in this to beat us up, folks. He's in this to prepare a bride so that we might be with him for the whole of eternity. So at the point when it gets to its very, very darkest point here, this is what it says. Verse 21, but after long abstinence from food, and by the way, for you guys that don't like fasting, this is not a fast. They can't eat. The word here, I mean, they simply can't eat. They, and they haven't eaten for 14 days. Can you imagine fighting with that wind for 14 days, sick, flying around the deck everywhere and waste, all kinds of things in pitch black, you can't navigate anymore because you navigate with the stars. You navigate with the North Star. No navigation, no revelation, absolute darkness. Just being driven along, not knowing where they're going. Nobody knows, no hope whatsoever. And in this time, Paul stood up in the midst of them. It, it, it always happens. And he says this, men, you should have listened to me. <laughs> and maybe one day you're going to have to say that to your family maybe one day you're going to have to say that to your family because they're, they're in fair havens they're going out on a jolly and they think everything's going to be alright and the Eurocladon's going to hit and maybe one day you're going to have to say to them you should have listened to me you should have listened to what I told you man you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Only of the ship. But not you. Just the ship. And there's much to learn. Much to learn. And throughout this whole COVID thing, I personally felt the Lord impressing upon me again and again and again that the church is not a building. It's not a building. 
The church is the people of God. We're the living stones that make up a holy temple. It's not about the carpets or the car park or this thing or that thing or the other thing. Or things that we've just got so myopic about for years. That is not the church. The church is the people. And he says here, listen, not one of you will be lost, but the boat will be wrecked. The boat will be wrecked. The denominations, the denominations which have meant so much to so people for so long are going to be split up and messed up severely. What's coming out of this is a remnant. It's not a new movement that's coming out of it. It's not a new denomination that's coming out of this. It's bust up broken people that get washed ashore by the grace of God. And he says, do not be afraid. Hallelujah. Do not be afraid. You must be brought before Caesar. He says, an angel appeared to me at night. And the angel said to him, do not be afraid. You must be brought before Caesar, Nero. The first one that would add up to 666. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. All of you. Now what, I don't know. I don't know. But I know this. It tells us in Revelation chapter 30. He who has wisdom, let him calculate the number. And wisdom comes from Christ. You can't have wisdom without Christ. You can't have a separate wisdom than Christ. He is the personification of wisdom. Let those that have wisdom calculate the number. Paul says, I'm going to have to appear before Nero. And he says, and so are you. So are you. And maybe we will. I don't know. I don't know. But I know what the scriptures say. I know what it says in Daniel. And I know the saints, the saints will go through an extremely difficult time according to Daniel and Revelation. An extremely difficult time. But he says, you will be saved. Amen? Yeah. Remember last week we looked at resurrection, how important it is? You will be saved. Take, therefore, take heart, man. For I believe, that God, uh, believe God that it will be just as it was told me. Take heart. Now very quickly, just turn to Mark chapter 6 verse 49. Just for a minute. Mark 6 verse 49. Take heart. Be of good cheer. Here they are in this typhoon. And Paul's saying be of good cheer. All four gospels include this storm. Mark chapter 6 verse 49. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea. And he was alone on the land. He was in the middle of the sea. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he would have passed them. And you know what happens. What, what time is the fourth watch of the night? Between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. It's exactly the time that these guys are in here right now it's actually at the time that Samuel heard the voice of the Lord when the lamp of the Lord was just about to go out God speaks and God will speak and there will in this in this night there will come a cry the bridegroom is coming and there will be those that will go and trim their lamps because they've got the oil they've they fell asleep but they got the oil and they're those that never got the oil This is the time period, 3 to 6 o'clock in the morning. By the way, this is the time when you go into rapid eye movement. This is the time when you go into lucid dreaming. This is the time of demonic attacks. If you ever get a demonic attack normally, it's between 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning. And he says here, be of good cheer. What did Jesus say to the disciples on the boat? Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. I'm with you. What does Paul say in this scenario? Be of good cheer. Not one of you will perish. 
However, we must run aground on a certain island. This is what he, he'd been told. Now, when the 14th night had come, there's a reason why this number is mentioned. I've already mentioned to you about the 14, 14, 14 generations, new seasons, etc. The 14th of Nisan, the 15th of Tishri, the 14th night had come. We were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea. I've been on there in a storm. I've actually been on the Adriatic Sea in a storm. We did a mission in Albania and on the way back at midday, it turned pitch black dark. That's the absolute truth. We sailed into a total storm. And uh, yeah, it's a very interesting experience. (laughs) Being driven by the Adriatic Sea about... Midnight, the sailors sensed that they were, they were drawing near some land. Notice the timing. And they took soundings. And it was 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little bit further, they took soundings. And again, it was 15 fathoms. Then fearing lest they should be run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for the day to come. Oh, isn't Christianity funny? It's so funny. Because when you're having a great time and life's excellent, you don't want the rapture to come, do you? You want to travel the world or do this or do that. You've got things, you know, you've got the, your year planned out and everything. But, but when you are in a storm, you would gladly allow the Lord to take you. Well, you won't get any choice in it anyway, but you would gladly have the Lord take you at any time. It's the way it is. And we're all the same, you know. We're all as fickle as the children of Israel were in the wilderness. We're all as stiff-necked. We have the same problems. We have the same faith issues. We grumble like they did. But there comes a point when everything is stripped away Everything is stripped away that you pray Maranatha. Maranatha. Even so, come Lord Jesus. They prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff, that is the the lifeboat, into the sea, under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow. So there was, there was guys on board here that clearly thought, no, I'm not having this. I'm not listening to this rabbi. We're getting out of here. And they tried to find another way. But let me tell you, because this is important. Noah was in the ark. Along with Noah, God was in the ark. He shut the door. He was with them. The most important thing about this boat is not the boat. The most important thing about this boat is the Apostle Paul was in this boat. And the Apostle Paul had a calling and he had to go to Rome. And as long as they remained with Paul, they were safe. But if they left, well, that was down to them. And that's how it is, friends. We must remain with our Saviour. We have to. And so they're trying to, under the pretense of, you know... Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. You cannot be saved. You've got to stay here. This is the plan. This is what the angel said. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall. They finally got it. Now imagine, Paul, because you know, you read in Paul's letters that he was always witnessing to people. All the time he was witnessing to people. He never stopped. And you could imagine that many of these people on board had heard the gospel. Many of them had heard the gospel. And finally, they cut away their emergency parachute. They cut away the lifeboat. And they've literally got nothing now. It's gone. That, that, that thing that we were relying on as a backup has gone. Now we are utterly cast upon this man's word for our lives. It's like Jonah. You know, what have you done? All the the Gentiles, what have you done? And as the day was about to dawn, Paul implored them to take food, saying, Today 
is the 14th day. You have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Now I just want to spin this through you for a couple of minutes before we... Look, we're not coming back tonight, folks, so you, you know what I mean. Give, cut me some slack. <laughs> I need to show you this. 14 is a very important number. It's the 14th of Nisan when the Passover lamb took care of our sins. Yes. But just have a quick look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. Now, the numbers and the verses were put in later. But there is a pattern in Scripture, and it's bizarre. You can see it. There's a pattern in Scripture. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 14... Some of you may know this, some of you may not, some of you may not care. But Nisan was the seventh month before God changed it to the first month. And Tishri, which we'll look at in a bit, was the first month and it was changed to the seventh month. So 714 in scripture is a very important month and date. It really is. On this verse they're asking who are these people who are they and where have they come from he said sir you know these are the ones that come out now that word come out is where we get the word ecclesia from ek come out of the great tribulation and what have they done they've washed their robes white and made them white in the what in the blood of the lamb what happens on the seventh month the 14th day of the seventh month the blood of the lamb covers the doorposts and in Revelation chapter 7 verse 14 the Gentiles that have come from nowhere who are they where have they come from these are the ones that have gone through the ultimate Passover yes. now it gets even more strange go to go to the first part of the Bible um, the book of Genesis book of Genesis chapter 7 Verse 14. You've heard it said that the Bible's like a loaf of bread. It's the same at both ends. So Revelation 7.14 and Genesis 7.14 describe the same event. Genesis 14, it says, come into the ark. Verse 13, come into the ark. Then it talks about the animals. Who are the animals? Who do the animals represent? Midrashically, who do they represent? The Gentiles. And every beast after its kind, all the cattle after the kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the face of the earth, all of them enter the ark. Genesis chapter 7 verse 14. They come into the ark, the storms come, and the ark goes up towards heaven in slow motion. The flood, the ark, is the rapture in slow motion. And it lands on the mountains. We're caught up into the clouds in the rapture. Yeah. It actually lands in the clouds on the mountains of Ararat. With no and his sons and, and the son's wives and those from every tribe, tongue and nation. That is what it means. That's what it means. Now, let's go a little bit further. Let us have a look at Exodus chapter 7 verse 14. Exodus 7 verse 14. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let you go. Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh's a type of Satan. We read in, in Revelation chapter 12, he doesn't want to let his people go. He's hounding them down because his time is short. It's another quite bizarre 714. Let's have another look, another look, another look, at, look at another one. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 14. Deuteronomy 7 verse 14 says this, You shall be blessed of all, all peoples. There shall be not a male or female barren among you or your livestock. What happens when we reach this place? We are blessed beyond understanding forever. Have a look at Numbers chapter 7 verse 14. Sorry, Judges chapter 7 verse 14. Judges chapter 7 verse 14 says this, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash. 
Anybody that understands the meaning of this, it is the sword of Gideon that's going to deliver them from the Midianites. When Jesus returns, he comes with a sharp sword in his mouth. It is the sword of Gideon. They all have this end time meaning. Have a look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. In Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, we understand exactly what the church needs to do in this time frame. Have a look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. You already know what it says. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Hallelujah. God is with us. Be of good cheer, he says to them, even though the boat's going to be buzzed to pieces, not one of you is going to lose your life. Why? Because God is is with you. Have a look at Daniel chapter 7 verse 14. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Again, it's another end time scripture. Have a look at Matthew chapter 7 verse 14. How are you going to get there? Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few that find it. How do you get there? It's narrow. It's difficult. There are few that find it. Have a look at Luke chapter 7 verse 14. And he came and he touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. What are we looking at? We're looking at the resurrection. Have a look at John chapter 7 verse 14. Now in the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and taught. What feast? The very feast that we're talking about this morning. Yom Kippur, the very feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. And what did he say on the last day of the feast? We'll come to this in a minute. On the last day of the feast, he says, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. For whoever drinks of me out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Well, you can look at these people in Revelation chapter 7 verse 14. And you can look at what happens to them because they're celebrating in the Feast of Tabernacles, you know. They're waving palm branches, celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. You know what date the Feast of Tabernacles is? It is on the seventh month, the 15th day of the seventh month, the 15th of Tishri. So on the 14th of Nisan, the blood of the Lamb is applied, and on the 15th of Tishri, we go into eternal joy. Revelation chapter 7 verse 14, where does he lead them to? He, the shepherd, the good shepherd, he leads them to streams of life. He stands up in the middle of the feast in John chapter 7 verse 14 at that feast. And on the last day of the feast he tells them, I want to take you to streams of life. Acts chapter 7 verse 14. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives, 75 in all. Those of you that understand typology will know that Joseph reveals himself a second time to his uh, brothers and uh, uh, and, uh, to Israel. It's a type of Jesus at the second coming. They don't understand him at the first coming. Who who is this guy? He's not going to reign over us. They say of Jesus, they said the same thing to Joseph. Joseph fed the world. Jesus of the bread of life. Joseph revealed himself to his brothers and sisters. It says they shall look upon him whom they have pierced and they will weep as though they weep for the only begotten. That's Uh, uh, Acts chapter 7 verse 14 Hebrews chapter 7 there are others Hebrews chapter 7 verse 14 for it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah of which tribe Moses spoke uh, nothing concerning the high priest in Revelation chapter 5 they ask the question who is worthy he says stop weeping for the lion of the tribe of Judah has overcome and has 
died in our stead. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 7 verse 14. Where are these people going? Who are they and where are they going? They've washed themselves white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them anymore. This is the feast of tabernacles. Why? For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when, when Paul alludes to the rapture, he quotes from Isaiah 25. What does Isaiah 25 say? God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, I know I've lost some of you there. I do. I know I've lost some of you. But I just wanted to re- you to rejoice with me. Amen. God is good, friends. We're, we're going to a good place. We're going to a good place. Now, let's finish off here. Because time's going on. And we've got important things to do. (laughs) Therefore I urge you take nourishment. For this is for your survival since not a hair will fall from your head. Jesus says that to the disciples when they're going to be persecuted. He says it. Not a hair will fall from your head. And when he had said these things, he took bread. He gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had uh, broken bread to eat, and they were all encouraged and also took food for themselves. Do not underestimate the power of blessing the food that you eat in front of unsaved people. Do not, if if you're scared of witnessing, if you're scared of giving the gospel, when you're with people, unsaved people, just say, do you mind if I just ask the Lord, this happened, uh, I can't remember what night it was now, we have some new people on again. Mikey, again, he says, would you like to bless the food, Tim? And then he turned around to him and he said, you know, when you've gone from this place, he says, I'll continue to thank God for this food. Amen. There was a young man there, six foot four, great big, strapping, mighty, enormous guy. And his job was to pack parachutes away all day long. That's all he did, because there's a way of packing them away. And if you get it wrong, people die. You get two cords crossed over the wrong way, your Roman candle down to the ground. And that was his job. And he was there, and it happens, friends. God will send people your way. And even if all you can do is just bless the food and let people know that you're a Christian, you'll be amazed You'll be amazed what that does. There's power in this breaking of bread. And there's power every time you thank the Lord for your food. You'll be amazed what a witness that is. And Paul broke bread and they were all, all of them, 276 of them, they were all encouraged. And, And in all, there were, oh yeah, 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and they threw the wheat into the sea. Does everybody understand what's going on here? They threw the wheat into the sea. Does everybody know what the wheat is? It's the word of God. What does it say in Ecclesiastes? Cast your bread upon the waters and in many days it will return. What's it telling us? It's telling us that in these days... Throw your wheat to the nations. Throw your wheat to the nations. Cast your bread upon the waters. Throw it to the Gentiles. Let them know about the Lord. That's what it means typologically. When it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay where the beach, you can go there to this day, by the way. It's on Malta. Onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let go of the anchors. Uh, and left them in the sea. Uh, meanwhile, oh, this is, this is just, this is just, uh, when this happens, you know you've arrived. When this happens to you, you know God's got you. And meanwhile, they loosened the rudder ropes. Yeah. <laughs> when God has finally gotten you, and you've got your hand off the steering wheel, right? And for some of you it's already happened, maybe once or twice in your life, and you, God puts you into a situation where you've, you're just no longer in control at all. Like, at all. You are utterly cast upon God. No more tying that rudder up with ropes, telling the Holy Spirit, this is the way we're going. 
No, you just let go. You just let go and you let that wind drive you wherever it is that God is sending you. He says, they let go of the rubber ropes. They, host, they hoisted the main sails like, okay, we're not fighting anymore now. Put the main sail up and wherever this wind blows us, that's where we're going to end up. And they made for the shore. But striking a place where two seas met, very interesting, they ran the ship aground and the prow struck fast and remained immovable. But the stern was broken up by the violence of the waves. So you, can you imagine this, folks? Can you imagine this? There you are. 14 days. No stars. No guidance. You, you guide yourself off the North Star. You know where to go from there. It's not there. You can't guide. There's no revelation. No visibility. No food. 14 days of fighting and fighting and fighting. All hope is lost. What the centurion said was wrong. What the captain said was wrong. There's just this short-legged, short guy with bald hair and a hooked nose. Who, who, who is he anyway that says, an angel has spoken to me. And although we're going to lose this boat, every single one of you are going to make it to the shore. And finally, they're trusting him. Finally, they're trusting this guy. And they set the sail. They let go of the rudder. And it runs into the sand. And it gets stuck and it's, you can, can, you, can you see the waves crashing around the stern, breaking the stern to pieces? And basically, all they have to do is grab something, like something that floats. Grab something and throw yourself at the shore. And this is a picture of the rapture of the church. It's a picture of the last days. When the, broke is, the, 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 the boat is finally beaten and broken into nothing. And those that reach the so shore, reach the shore broken and in pieces. This is my body, broken for you. And he was broken for us, friends, so that one day we're going to be utterly whole. Let's just finish this. The soldiers plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion wanted to save Paul, kept them from their purpose, and commanded that those who could swim should jump uh, overboard first and get to the land. And the rest, some on boards, I love it, some on boards, some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped to the safety of of the land. Listen friends, all these empires that we've built up over the years, buildings, cathedrals, great and mighty lofty places, they're going to be bust down to nothing. And ultimately folks, we're going to make it to the shore broken up. Broken up but whole in Christ. Now, I don't care how I get that you. If I, if, I, if I am coming in on pieces of rubble, I don't care. I just want to get there. I just want to be with the Lord. I want to hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. The thought of not hearing those words is terrifying. We must hear those words. I tell you, just in closing, many years ago, I had a very odd dream. And uh, we, were, we were living up at Harrisy Head. And in this dream... The Lord spoke to me and he said to me, in 15 days time, you will know the will of God. And in the dream, I said to the Lord, Lord, that's the 15th of Tishri. And the dream ended. I woke up, I thought, oh my goodness, I've just heard the Lord. So I got a calendar out and I counted 15 days. And it landed on Good Friday, the day that we celebrate the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know that, the, you know, it's, it's messed up a bit, but I was a young Christian. For me, that's exactly what it meant. That is the day that the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. And I say this to my shame. I spent all day thinking somebody's going to come up to me from nowhere and tell me the will of God. And I got to the end of the day and I thought, 
You told me. In 15 days time you will know the will of God. I've been waiting all day. And you can miss the cross. You can miss the cross. Get caught up with all the other stuff. And miss the will of God for your life. Is to be saved. To be cleansed from all of your unrighteousness. To be absolutely made fit for heaven. On the 14th of Nisan. The 14th of Nisan. The 14th of Nisan. 714. The blood of lamb, the lamb, is applied to the believers. On the 15th of Tishri, which is intrinsically linked to the 14th of Nisan. So in the dream, I said to the Lord, No Lord, that's the 15th of Tishri you're talking about. The 15th of Tishri is the very last feast and it is the most important day of that feast but here's the thing it took me a long time to realize what the lord was saying because i was expecting this guy to come up to me and say god wants you know but i finally i do understand what it means now the cross is the way the cross is the way And as we take up our cross, and it's not easy, it's difficult, as we deny ourselves in this life, as we totally believe upon our Saviour for everything that he's done for us, it will lead us to the 15th of Tishri. Our God isn't just about suffering, folks. Ask the Jewish people what the 15th of Tishri is. It is the most joyous day of the Jewish year. And we've run out of time, but it says in Leviticus chapter 23 that on the 15th of Tishri, you are to come before me with palm branches. And you're to wave. And at Nisan, at the time of the cross, Palm Sunday, they were waving palm branches. They were waving palm branches, weren't they? But that's not the time for waving palm branches. However, it is intrinsically linked to the cross. Do you understand? So even though they were celebrating the wrong feast on that day, they were not. Because it's through the cross that we as a body, with all our faults and all our failures, for all the times that we have been faithless to the Lord, where we bickered and argued and gossiped and got into all manner of sin, the Bible says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you. Seven times a righteous man will fall, but he will get back up again. You may enter heaven hanging on to a piece of wood, friends. But I'll tell you this, you will reach the shore. You will reach the shore if you put your faith in Christ and in the finished work of the cross.